Oi, you're tuned in to Dry That Aussie Metal, guys, so make sure to hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss any of his sick content. And remember, stay brutal, you legend. I'm very excited. Again, g'day, legends. Here we go. How the bloody hell are you going? We have myself, Dry That Aussie Metal guy, and my ever-present, always on the ball, co-host Jim <laughs> Taylor. How are you going, my friend? And happy Doing new wonderful. Year. Happy New Year to you too, sir. This is great, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. As I was just saying before the, 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 we jumped on mic, that I'm glad Christmas and New Year's over. Big New Year's to all the all the watchers and the listeners of the Bloody Legends. Hope you had a cracking one, but I am glad that is all over. As we have people coming in <laughs> quickly, we've got Kerry White about to jump in from Novarium. We'll just admit him in there as yeah. I'm going through my intro. Today, Legends, we have more <laughs> guests. We did have Spider One just before the breakup of the end of 2022. That's right. And we wanted to keep this rolling with some really great guests all through hopefully 2023. I've already started lining up some really killer guests. I had Novarium awesome. reach out to us, which Jim can tell us a little bit about Novarium. But we do have Kerry White, yeah. who's about to jump in, who's the bass bassist. We also have D Anthony from Drums. Um, Dean Michaels, the one who hit me up. And Sean Grunholt, both of Guitars. And Lisa DiArcangelis of Novarium. So that's pretty cool, man. It's a sweet, man. Very yeah. cool. <laughs> so, so tell us a little bit about more of these guys, dude, because they kind of, um, they know you and they kind of reached out to me and that's kind of how I found they, them. We, I haven't seen these guys for a long time. So I, I was, um, uh, I, I, my, my brother's in, uh, 1818. So these guys are from, uh, uh, close by where uh, I was in a band 1818 from PA. These guys are from v Virginia, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's been a while, uh, yeah. since I've seen these guys, but um, I think last time Lisa came out to a gig when I, I, I stepped in on bass for 1818, so it, it's been a hot minute. But there, uh, we in the tri state area with um, uh, Phil or uh, Phil, I'm sorry, Pennsylvania, um, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, there's a big metal scene in the uh, tri-state area here and the end of no favor or no exception. Uh, they are uh, fantastic and just amazingly brutal. And, um, and they, they just released a new video uh, as of a couple days ago. So uh, they've got definitely got some new stuff on the horizon. So this the is Phoenix, very exciting. I believe the Phoenix. Called, yeah. We'll the talk Phoenix more about with the band Wonderful. as they jump in, they should be about 10, 12 minutes off of jumping in. I know Kerry awesome. has jumped in. He's Very got cool. his mic on mute if he feels like jumping in saying good day. He can. If not, he can just hang around in the back there. Um, I do want to acknowledge the passing of Jeff Beck. He um, recently passed away as uh, well. And I noticed some posts all over the place as well. He contributed to just about everybody um, starting out, I think, with the Yardbirds. Um, played well obviously with the Yardbirds there Eric Clapton That's right. and then um John Bon Jovi also contributed on one of John Bon Jovi's biggest albums he, working all through the 1960s 70s just did on uh, uh Ozzy's record uh, yep. just recently too yeah, uh, he's going to let us all oh, finish talking okay. our points and I'll hop into the little, <laughs> little, little, little hits as we've got a little messenger going on there. I'm really excited as to what's going to happen with 2023 and with the Bloody Legends, as we're just saying, Jeff Becker's recently passed. What kind of an impact did he have on you being a guitarist? Me, I'm just more of a kind of watching people noodle and get blown away by great riffs. But for you, you oh, it, 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 he, he was so versatile. In, in what he did because he played every genre he wasn't limited to uh one genre and y you'll see photo I, I just saw a photo with him it was uh Hetfield him I think Ronnie Wood um so you've got you know classic rock and you know uh the metal scene in you know in, in one guitarist um he's of a generation of guitar players that again fluidity is is definitely a word that comes to mind and, and he was just unparalleled yeah and the impact he would have had on so many guitarists absolutely in his lifetime you can kind of see it because i've got so many musos on my page everybody's kind of little acknowledged the, the passing of this man and the, the great work body of work that he has been involved in what studio albums truth beckola rough and ready jeff beck group blow by blow wide there and back flash Jeff Beck's Guitar Shop, who else? You had it coming, Jeff, Emotion and Commotion, Loud Hailer, co Collaborative. He also done some collaborative stuff as well. That um, collaboration he Quite done with like Eric Clifton and everybody else was really cool as well. Um, two moments. 
There we go. We are well back done. and we now have Kerry. We were just talking about Jeff Beck as my real estate agent stuck her head in. Kerry, how are you going, <laughs> my friend? It's going good, guys. How are y'all? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Dude, um, this is awesome. Thank you for coming yeah. on. This is awesome. Hey, what thanks you, for having us. This is a treat. This is an absolute <laughs> treat, man. Looking forward to chatting to you all um, as you drop in as well. Kerry White has jumped in. Absolutely. He is, of course, the basis for Novarium. Kerry, tell us your earliest musical memory, my friend. I've been asking this people uh, people I've been asking this question from people and it's quite interesting the response I get. Man, I I have kind of a weird story. I don't I don't exp- it's it's kind of I think it's off the beaten path. So I don't expect people to like identify with it or relate love, to it, but I love that. <laughs> tell it anyway, right? Right. So, I exactly. grew up in a um kind of a, a fundamentalist uh, Southern Baptist household, which is not a problem mm. in itself, right? But Back in the early 90s, the the Christian sphere had a weird habit of copying off of popular music and make I'm no longer affiliated, by the way, but like it's they had a weird habit of um, copying popular music at the time and sort of trying to make their own hits out of that. Right. So uh, growing up, my my parents were really into a band called the Newsboys, which is a old <laughs> Christian like alt rock band right? even very well aware yeah. <laughs> yeah so uh and peter furler actually i believe is a singer uh new zealand or australia i can't remember but yeah so i i grew up listening to this band right and they did this bit during one of their shows where uh the drummer uh they they said something like you got to give this guy a big round of applause if you don't give him a big round of applause he'll get off the drum kit he'll go down the center aisle he'll go to the concession stand and he will eat until that concession stand is empty and he eats a lot and i just as a kid you know watching this this like movie uh this this vhs with this band on it i was like this is hilarious for some reason yeah. it's hilarious and he had these big wide eyes and this really furious stare you know and as a kid i was so entertained by it but um watching him play i was always fixated on that guy uh his name was duncan phillips i believe the drummer that is really what started me to be inspired by like oh music is a really cool thing now i started playing piano uh, my mom put me through like one or two piano lessons that i didn't really pay attention through but we had a piano in the house and i had an understanding of piano and my dad played acoustic guitar so we always had an acoustic guitar in the house so i would deedle around on them and and it's sort of learned by touching and feeling things but it wasn't until uh watching this weird vhs of a live show with the newsboys on it that i was like that is it's actually entertaining it's not just you know you deedle around on the piano it's actually something that can be a show and can be performative and i I, like i said i was really young um but i do remember that watching those shows and it wasn't until high school that i actually freshman year of high school that my entire world changed and i got into industrial metal uh i was watching the movie triple x with vin diesel which if you haven't seen it it's a completely (laughs) ridiculous movie but yes it's awesome (laughs) yeah it is in the movie they have uh ramstein playing at a concert and vin diesel's character is at the concert right and i was like i who are these people you know i got i was kind of a cloistered kid so i didn't have a whole lot of access to different types of music and stuff. But when I saw that, I was like, I got to check this band out. I looked them up on the early internet and um, sure enough, that was my gateway into metal basically. So very, very crazy uh, uh, change from going to Christian knockoffs of pop music to uh, industrial metal, to Gothic metal and, and thrash and all the other stuff I do. But yeah, here I am. Yeah, they were they were from Australia as well, Newsboys. Um, yeah. They're from Mooloolaba, so I do apologise for that, my friend. I feel the need to apologise <laughs> being an Aussie as well. <laughs> but, um, hey, it got me where I am today, so I'm okay with right. that. Right. That's cool. Yeah. Um, that was the, the kind of, for a lot of people, that was kind of the first step into heavy metal. I know um, there was a lot of film clips. I know um, do, um, Tales of the, the the Living Dead one, the crypt, Tales from the Crypt one with Pantera. Yeah. That one was a really... Mm-hmm big one for me but also the crow soundtrack and you mentioned the triple x soundtrack was unreal there were so many of these great soundtracks and i don't i don't know if they've done it for the us but i know over here in australia when you get your vhs vhs people was what they used to put movies on um you go to the video shop you get your vhs and sometimes they'd have like a film clip of a band 
prior to it, you know what I mean, kind of in the trailers. So I, I'd caught a lot of bands like that. I know Super Heist from Australia was one that had um the Bullet soundtrack on before movies as well. You get like for around that time, depending on what year you'd get or what season, they'd sometimes put a soundtrack on it, which for me was really big, you know, to to, to discovering bands as well. So it's interesting that that was the, the step into heavy metal for you. Yeah, you know, the other thing is you could actually get – um and this didn't last very long, I think maybe, I, I don't know. Sometimes you would buy a VHS um, and you would also get a separate CD, which is what people used to put music on. Yep. And <laughs> that would be, um, they would give you the independent soundtrack for the whole movie. It was just the music, you know, and that was a way for people to pick out, Oh, I really like this song. Let's go check out that band. And it was great. So, so tell me a little bit about your, your evolution as a young metalhead. How, how did this go from you playing piano to wanting to be a bassist? Was piano something you're still doing? Um, you know, tell yeah. us a little bit about your journey as a musician so far. Yeah, so I, I kind of do it all. Um, and, and anytime anyone asks me a story to do, anything to do with me when it comes to a story is sit down and let's have dinner and I'll take up two hours telling you the complexities of it all. But so we do it. <laughs> uh, I'll give you the I'll give you the real short version. So I was kind of an angry kid, like I said, uh, growing up in a Southern Baptist fundamentalist household. You kind of learn to be angry at some things, and you, you know you come out of that not not being too happy. So uh, discovering metal was really an outlet for me, and that was my gateway into like, okay, I can I, there's there's better and smarter things to spend my energy on than like you know, physical or like material harm, you know, I can just be angry with this music and that's really good. So, uh, you know, piano is not particularly hardcore. I mean, it can be, they got power metal, they got all kinds of stuff that's got keyboard in it and it's amazing, but I wanted something that was a little crazier. And again, like getting into drums at a young age, I was like, this is perfect. I can hit stuff. I can, you know, get it all out on the drum kit. Awesome. Let's do this. And I got my first drum kit when I was uh, 16. And from then on, I, I would play like on the weekends, I would play like eight hours a day, right? So I really transitioned into drums and I played drums for a huge part of my life. But it came about when I was probably, uh, it started when I was about 12 or so. My dad decided to get me a program that I could actually record music on um, very early, you know, programs back then and he he decided like you're always trying to write music and trying to write stuff down let me give you a program that you can just record it and listen back to it best best decision ever because i still do that today but having the recording capability doesn't give you the ability to have all the other instruments so mm -hmm. i realized like i don't have any friends that play music i have hardly any friends at all i need these other instruments in here so that's when i decided mm -hmm. I can learn I, when I learned that you could drop D a guitar and make it sound, you know, you could fake a chord. I was like, this is great. So, <laughs> you know, I really started picking up guitar and bass sort of at the same time. Hey, Lisa. So I could <laughs> start recording my own music, you know? So it, it really came about as necessity that I wanted to record music. I wanted to get some stuff out there that was more than just, you know, bumping around in, in really crappy VSTs, early VSTs. So I had to learn everything in order to make anything at all. So, 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 so my next question was that you kind of answered it there, but before I ask it, Lisa DiArcangelis, um, vocalist for Novarium has joined and Sean Grunholt, guitarist as well, has joined and Dean shouldn't be too far away since he was the one who set all this up. Um, I was going to quickly <laughs> mention, Terry, um, you, your parents must be pretty cool with it all. Then coming back and going, look, um, I'm not playing any news, boys. Fucking loving the industrial metal. <laughs> <laughs> They're all pretty cool with it all. <laughs> but I wish I could agree with you. No, my I bought a uh, the first CD I ever bought was Mutter by Ramstein. Oh, my mom found oh, it. Wow. And threw it away. <laughs> yeah. So, which doesn't do anything. I just went and bought it again. You know, but nice. um, yeah, my my dad has always been supportive of every music it doesn't matter what it is if it's something productive if it's music if it's art mm. expression he's all about it my mom was not so it's a little little different yeah, definitely a little different um g'day sean how you going mate doing good man how about yourself yeah i'm good jim's we got jim over there as well 
Awesome. How you doing, brother? <laughs> this good, is great. Good. Good. good to see y'all. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, welcome to the Bloody Legends podcast with Jim and myself. Um, absolute pleasure to have you, Sean. I did ask Kerry there, earliest musical memory for you, my friend. Mm. Oh, man. So growing up, I didn't really have much of a musical background. Didn't come from a musical family or anything of the like. But I remember playing some video games in the mid '90s, the Command and Conquer video games, and I'm I'm really dating myself. Oh they had no! Amazing metal soundtracks, and I was like, "Damn, there's something about this." And <laughs> one day, my mom came in, and I had the game on pause, and I'm just listening to music, and she's like, "I think you're playing this more for the music than the actual game." And you know, damn right. So ever <laughs> since then, it's been this drive to go after the heaviest sound possible, and whoever's offering that, I'm all for it. That's what I'm after. Well, how, how did that That's evolve? Very cool. How did that evolve into heavy metal for you, man? Where, well, well, tell us about your little bit about your journey leading into heavy metal and then onto guitars. Oh yeah, so like pretty much every kid growing up in the late '90s, you know, who liked slightly heavier stuff, I was listening to you know, Metallica on the radio, this, that, and the other, Pantera, and eventually, you know, I started listening to the more up and coming groups like Corn and uh, Disturbed and System of a Down, and then kind of like Carrie. I heard this German metal outfit called Rammstein and I listened to one of their tracks and I was like, wow, holy shit, I need more of that. So I bought yeah. one album after the other and just, you know, went off the deep end into metal. And ever since then, it's just been like a one way street. So from that point onward, I think I kind of found my tribe. I found my sound. And as far as getting into guitar, well, mm. that started for me, honestly, it sounds really prosaic and lame, but the truth was I was just hanging out with some friends one day in high school and a couple of these guys were like, yeah, it'd be cool to learn guitar, you know? And I was like, I don't do anything cool in my life. Playing guitar, that would be cool. And so my dad had this old acoustic that he bought when he was in uh, the military over in Japan decades earlier. And I, I came home that day and I was like, dad, can you show me some stuff on the guitar? And he's like, okay. He showed me three chords which was the extent of his knowledge. And he's like, okay, here you go. You're on your own. And from that point <laughs> onward, it just became this journey to learn and better myself on guitar. And um, wasn't too long after that before I got an electric and bam, you know, fast forward on the tape and here we are. And here we are. Awesome. Awesome. Lisa, how are you going, my friend? Jim and myself. I here. am I am okay. Sorry, I was uh, having a crisis with one of my kids. But no, I no, no worries. Around. <laughs> totally understand. I've got three daughters of my own. I was in the middle of a house inspection as we started this. That was running a little bit late, so a little. A oh my gosh! Happens. Um, earliest musical memory for you, Lisa? Earliest musical memory. Oh, uh, yeah. I used to sing with my dad when I was a little kid. My dad, my dad's an amazing singer and uh, guitar player, and he used to play acoustic Beatles songs, and I would sing along with him. I think that's probably oh, the nice. earliest. Yeah, that so it was all Beatles stuff. He used to tell me stories about they would play, they would play the cassette tapes of the Beatles in the car, and I would be quiet. And then if they turned it off, I would cry, like when I was real, real like a baby. But <laughs> like, I loved, I've always loved music, I guess. That's cool. Yeah, that, that is that's really, a very, it's very soothing. <laughs> it is very yeah. soothing. My, my daughter was more into a Mona Martha's as I was growing up. I used to play that to her and she'd be like, Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. Know, she, something about the beat now, she's not really as much into it, but yeah, she still loves listening <laughs> to music with me. So that's really, really good. That's awesome. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you first got into heavy metal, how that kind of evolved from you know, singing along to the Beatles with your parents when you were little with your dad to, to, to now? I think the biggest influence of that is probably my brother, because I still remember mm. my, I have an older brother. He's about he's four and a half, five years older than me. And he got really into Pantera, Metallica, stuff like that in the early 90s. And, you know, I was in elementary school and I still remember coming up the stairs in our childhood house singing Enter Sandman. <laughs> and my brother nice. being like, where did you hear that? You know, and I was like, yeah. oh, I, and I used to take all his CDs and stuff when we were older. So I think I can credit him with really kind of getting me into it. And I think I had like the natural progression of like, I got really into like rock, like Aerosmith, that kind of stuff. And then I got really into punk and then I got really into metal. So I kind of like evolved into that later on in life, probably like high school age was when I really, really started getting into metal. 
Nice. Um, and it's funny that you mentioned that because my sister got me in a Pantera. I remember her coming home from primary school and she had this um, Cowboys from Hell tape and she's like, bro, have a listen to this and chucked it in. And I was like, <laughs> fuck yeah. So it was good to see yeah. it come back around the other way. That's awesome. Yeah, that that I, I can't remember what the first thing was that he played for me from Pantera. It probably was Cowboys from Hell. Yeah. Because that wasn't that, mm. didn't that come out in like 91, I think. Yeah, yeah something like that. Uh, yeah, so no- I... 90, 90, 91. Yeah. Somewhere in yeah, there. 91. Yeah. So I, I, I bet you that was probably cause I would have been like five. That was probably about when he would have gotten me that kind of stuff. Yeah. Wow. Nice. That spun out. So me and Jim were talking just before we all, you guys jumped in. Jim was, mm. Jim knows all you guys as well. So that's part of the reason we've, we've set all this. It's up been a while. Well. <laughs> yeah. He did say it's been a while, but um, he kind of mentioned briefly that he kind of knew all you guys as well. So Correct. Uh, at least I think the last time we saw each other was at Granny's, and oh my I, gosh. I. So I I was I was bassist for eighteen eighteen, for for yeah, uh, yeah. a couple of years, and we we played at Granny's with Demise, right. and you came you came down and hung out with me, Paul and Cody. It was it was a really good time. So that's oh that's been a, I, I that's had, been a I long had time. Blast with you guys, <laughs> yeah. I had a blast with you guys. <laughs> you all were a lot of fun. I still have um. On the back of my makeup case that I use for yeah, like yeah. my ovarium stuff, I still have my eighteen eighteen sticker on there. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, no, that, I I'll I'll tell you, that was my so I'm forty one. That was my first really metal band, and I knew those oh, really? guys. Yeah, I knew those guys for a long time, and through 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 them, I had I would see you guys, um, um, Elysium um my gosh i'm trying to i'm i'm, I'm drawing a blank uh um um uh, disfigure you know yeah. and it, and it, it's it, you know i was telling jay the, the the quad state area that we have here with virginia maryland pennsylvania west virginia it's 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 a hard you got some hard music and yeah. and you guys <laughs> were i mean you know and it was for a while there it was kind of hard nowadays we have we have you know it, it, we've got a lot of places in the area um that we can go now that used to not be a thing and yeah. it was just west virginia if you remember the old cookies days i don't know if you guys oh, man. do you remember yes, do you remember guys that. remember that i okay. do and and it was hard to find um venues for heavy music um because cover bands cover bands and tribute bands is a big thing and that's and that's right. great but to, but for original hardcore metalcore just heavy music in general it you had you were in basements you were in people's yeah. houses uh actually ironically enough church sanctuaries were a few yeah. of them as well <laughs> and yeah. um so so for us it was, it was a really that was cool to be um that was I. I cut my teeth. I I I joined the. I stepped in. I was like, guys, I I'm never, you know, uh, yeah, I'll step in and 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 you know, uh, wherever you want me. And it was cool because I got to meet all you guys and uh, actually a lot lot of uh, bands that are now touring um nationally like Artifice, and yeah. they're doing their thing now and all that. So it this is really cool to have you guys on here now. And I do this podcast half a world away with my brother, Jay. So this is really cool that you guys could be on here. It's a small world. Yeah, well, it's awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. That's really awesome. <laughs> well, I want to touch on that because it does seem like a really, really cool scene over in Virginia. I've chatted to a whole bunch of doom metal, stoner metal bands from down that way as well. Artifacts, sure. but the, mm-hmm. the genre the, the heavy metal genre and the gamut of bands goes across from doom metal to you guys who have that really killer symphonic gothic metal sound gothic. i know you absolutely have, yeah cornered that sound really well as well so it must be a good scene to kind of play in and expand your roots from as well eh? Mm. it is pretty good i think um but like you know like jim was saying that we really had to like work kind of stick stick it out you know because there was a period in time where there just wasn't any place for us to be but mm-hmm. now there is a lot better uh like welcoming from the venues and you know we being in this area is kind of nice too because we've got dc close by we've got baltimore close by we've got some big cities and then the Mm. smaller areas that you know we can kind of pick up um 
you know, smaller venues and stuff like that, that are, can get more people in there. Um, it's just, it's, it's changed a lot in these last, I, I don't know. For I'm sure. trying to think of when cookies was, I was like, that had to have been like 15 years ago. Wow. When I can't, when I can't remember. Like, yeah, it was. That's yeah. good you have venues that you can play at even, you know, not many back then. But down here in the country, I totally get what you're saying. Like, you can only fucking mm-hmm. put on a cover band or right. some yeah. dude walking up and press and play on his deck. You know what I mean? Do, 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 do. Like, that's right. it's yeah. fucked in some areas because the, these venues won't take a chance. And it, it leaves the, the local right. music scene really fucking stagnant and hard to go anywhere. Unless you can play somebody else's music or press play on a deck, then you don't really fucking right. stand a chance, especially no in these country areas that I live. I'm about 300 kilometers away from Adelaide, which is my closest city. So if you're in the country and you're in a band that plays original music, you're fucked pretty well unless you're willing to travel to Adelaide whenever their show's happening. I know we've got a local band called Zella Rage that do really well. They're about to go play with Power Man 5000 next okay. week, but they've got to travel and really fucking bust their asses if they're going to be get themselves known anywhere. Right. Yeah, that's. I think that's pretty similar to kind of... I feel like this area, especially... We, we talked about this a little while back that... Um, this area can kind of get, I don't want to say clicky. That's not what I mean. Um, mm-hmm. But it ends up that like you, you do have to kind of like prove, prove your shit, right? Like you have to <laughs> show that you're worth it before you can really get on some of these stages, so, which so is the fine. Big stage, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is fine. And it is nice that we do have some of the smaller venues now so that we can get to that point. But um, yeah, it, it, I think this, area has really changed a lot it, you know thinking back 15 20 years ago when we were you know when i i wasn't even in bands at that point you know but going to see bands and stuff like that that there was just nothing back then. that's why it's especially important that if you have bands like say Navarium or anyone playing in your local area and you want original bands to thrive get along and buy tickets to these shows sell them out mm. so the venue owners and the promoters are going like wow okay and we've got original music coming absolutely we're getting the crowds in we're getting the numbers in and then you can get more events on so people need to realize that as well yeah definitely uh, so jumping into novarium tell us a little bit about how the band started tell us all about yourselves in the beginning of novarium sure i'll take it first so in the beginning, I was playing with a separate project and it ended up falling apart. And the singer who I'd been working with reached out to me about a month later and said, hey, I met this guy and his brother and they're putting something together, which I think is really great. And do you have any interest in doing this? And I said, yeah, sure. So put me in touch. So I met up and it turned out to be Dean, who I should point out, unfortunately, I found out he's actually not going to be joining us tonight. So we'll have to make do. But all the same i met him and his brother and i thought damn okay what they're doing here is really good stuff and yeah. that was the very beginning of novarium and it wasn't long after that that um we started writing material and a cohesive band started to emerge so that's when i first came into the scene man awesome. we're i think i might have been after that i was after you i think sean because i uh dean found me on youtube with a random project that I was doing here and he reached out and asked if I would do it and initially I was like no because I'm doing this other thing I don't want to like do too many things I won't you know spread myself too far and um but then that one fell apart which ironically in this area it was a cover band right (laughs) so eventually I was like you know what I do want to like try to do some original stuff and just like see how that goes right so um you know, I, I reached back out to him and I was like, Hey, I know I said no, uh, like a year ago, but like, do you need anyone now? Cause I'll come <laughs> back if that's, you know, so, um, and it turns out that they, they did. Um, and I think that I like one of the things that I think makes us work so well together is that we all are very responsible musicians in the way that like we're all in different places but we can always count on each other to like do do your shit and show up to the practice there's no like we never 
because we were so far apart, I don't think we ever practiced like, you know, a lot of bands, they practice like every week, right? Mm. Um, that's not, that has never been the way of Novarium. We play like what? We we get together and rehearse once before a show or something like that. Right. Wow. And it's like, hope, hope everything goes well. Like, um, but yeah, I mean, and we all just really, like, I, I personally just loved the music and I loved the fact that all of these guys were you know for one pulling their own weight because that was always an issue you know I mean I'm sure anyone that's played in bands like you have you have experienced that at some point in your uh career that you've had to kind of drag somebody through but um but I think we all just like really meshed well and that is really really hard to find it's hard to find people that are on the same wavelength as you musically and beyond that like that you can get along with when we have to be in the car together for um you know 10 hours for three no days doubt. or whatever <laughs> <laughs> like, you want to have a good time too right so that gotta be able to hang you, you can't just like oh well we're gonna do blue ridge but i want to kill you but smile smile we're gonna smile. play you know? <laughs> yeah well actually we, we were talking about that recently i don't i don't can't remember if carrie and sean i can't remember if you were on when me and dean were talking about it but there was some show in i think we i think you guys were there and i can't it's escaping me now what show we played that dean and i got into a fight right before we went on stage sean do you remember oh, that man. carrie that might have been before you yeah, it might have been. I don't think it was here. It was, it was, it was one that we were like, "This show is gonna suck ass," and then we got there and it was like really great. It was like it was one of the best shows you had because <laughs> you got all that. It was somewhere in Virginia. Like, I can't remember. Yeah. Maybe maybe Fredericksburg or something. I can't remember. Okay, but we were talking about that, but we had like one of the cool things about it was like it happened. We played a show. It was great. And then it was over. You know what I mean? And like there was yeah. no, there's no like, like hardcore. Like it's kind of like the way that it makes me think of me and my brother. Like when my brother and mm. I were kids and we would like get into fights, we'd be like, fuck you. And then it would be like, what do you want to eat for dinner? You know what I mean? Like it's just, <laughs> it's here and it's gone. Like, cause it doesn't matter at the end of the Happy day. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> right. <laughs> Holidays are fun at my house. <laughs> and also, you're all friends and you know what I mean? Like a band family and that, but you also got to look at as um, being professional as well. Sometimes you're going to have disagreements with your colleagues. It's how you deal with it and move forward. Mm. Uh, you know, push this beast and this band forward. You know what I mean? Not getting too caught up on the the fucking little minutiae of bullshit that comes along with it. You know, right? Yeah. And Definitely. working hard, working hard. I was talking to a band yesterday. They were talking about playing live. You know, speaking on the professional side of things. When you go play these shows and you you're getting paid, you 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 don't go blow all your money away on piss. You know what I mean? You you have a couple of you one or two drinks with your fans, or you drink your soft drinks or whatever, but then you treat it kind of like more of a, a, a job, you know, you love your music and everything, but you've got to go along to these shows and treat it as a profession as well. Not go to these shows, write yourself off on fucking drugs and piss and then just be a fucking Wally up there on stage. Cause you're not going to be able to get your next show. Your bands are going to go fuck you. And then you're not going to go anywhere. Yeah. You're thousand right about percent. that. Thousand percent. <laughs> thousand percent. Uh, tell us about the Carrie, first. I can't remember. You go, Carrie. Sorry. No, you go. I was going to let mm. Carrie to say how he came up in this yeah. mess of a. <laughs> That's... Well, it wasn't a mess till I got here. I think. <laughs> no. Uh, so I've known Sean for a long time, like I think since I was eighteen or something. It's it's been a long time. Mm. We uh we met because we have similar tastes in music. Uh, to give a short story, and I actually went and saw you guys, uh, twice. I think before I even got asked to to sub for the band because uh, our, our our regular drummer, Anthony, uh, couldn't make all the shows because he has kind of a crazy work schedule. So I get a text from Sean one day saying, um, hey, would you be interested in subbing on drums for a couple shows here and there? Uh, we have a, I think it was, um, it was one of the tours that we went on. I had like two weeks to to learn everything. And he said, we're, wow. do, we're doing this tour in like two weeks. Can you, can you make it right? Two or three weeks. I said, yeah, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, 
just spent spent a lot of days in my drum room playing and and making it happen uh so over time i i kept doing that you know so i i stayed on the roster as a sub when anthony couldn't make all the shows and eventually novarium found a need for a bass player and i got the call that said would you like to be a full-time member uh playing playing bass full-time to which i said absolutely yes and i think that was right before another show that we were about or another tour that we were about to play or something but it somehow lined up i had a couple of weeks to learn all the material right before a big deal but and <laughs> i've been here playing bass ever since so yeah, nice. Fantastic. As my camera decides to have a little bit of a meltdown there, this was doing it yesterday as well. It must be handy, <laughs> um, Kerry, when it comes to the songwriting process as well, being able to bounce around between guitar, drums, and bass. It's nice to have. Yeah. Um, guitar is my least, my my least um, capable instrument, but it is nice to have at least some vocabulary when it comes to guitar so I can communicate with mm. Dean, I can communicate with Sean. Um, it's nice to be able to have drum experience because I, I, you know, being a bassist, you, you're in the pocket with a drummer. It's metal. Right. I know it's metal. And everyone says like metal has no soul, but you are in the pocket with the drummer, no matter what you're playing. And if you're right. not, it's wrong. So um, being able to communicate with all the instruments in the band or, or being able to have the shared vocabulary is an awesome deal. Yeah. Um. So, what year did you join in, man? I didn't catch what year was that. Oh, I have no idea. What? Yeah. Was it <laughs> after was, the uh, debut album drop? Because I want to chat about the the debut album. This as was well, after. Bro. Yeah. 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 This um, was, was a yeah. good while after that. Yeah. Yeah. That's Maybe like eighteen. Two thousand eighteen. Okay. Before the the, the EP, the Stone of a Soul. Mm -hmm. You guys, you guys have been. Are we on a ten ten year anniversary? We are. Twenty thirteen. 2013, no, no, 20, wow. 2013, oh, yeah. I believe, yeah. Wow, oh, so it kind of took you three years kind of to kind of get that album out as well. Tell us a little bit about right. the three years leading up to and the making of that debut album for you. Yeah, I'll start with that. So for probably the first year and a half, we had a different singer. Uh, the mm -hmm. band, as it was constituted back then, had a completely different lineup, minus me, uh, Dean, and uh, our drummer at the time. We had a different bassist, different singer. And we were just working together as a group to try and, you know, get this thing off the ground, write some material and eventually, you know, generate enough buzz and uh, develop enough competency on this material to play some shows. And it was probably a year into this effort that we realized that our singer just wasn't going to cut it. And that's always mm -hmm. a dicey situation to be in, especially when you're all kind of friendly with each other. And so right. we ultimately had to go our separate ways. And it was around that time, probably one year mark, I would say, that Lisa joined the fold. And then it was just a short burst of art. Right, here's what we've written. Lisa, do your best to learn it. And then, bam, not long after that, we booked our first shows. And then it was probably about a week. Um, no, not a week. <laughs> Definitely longer than that. I'd say it's probably close to a year's worth of playing shows before we finally had, I don't know, all the momentum and everything to be like, okay, now we're going to focus all our energy on the album and so mm -hmm. that's what we did so it was june 2016 almost three years exactly to when the band formed that we finally released the first album it's, uh, um omicron right yeah there you go <laughs> yep there she is yeah yeah killer, dean and I killer about, about, yeah dean and i were actually talking about how we you know, the initial focus was just kind of on like recording that music. Mm -hmm. And then um, we we booked that like show. There was a like a random like small show at uh, some place in Alexandria. I cannot remember, but. Want the Birchmare, was it? Uh, no. Are we talking about the debut? What, what are we talking about? Yeah. Lisa? Yeah. Yeah, that was O'Shaughnessy. First... Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Yeah. How can I okay. That? Um, yep. yeah, so, was very cool. Oh, shows. Yeah. We were talking about how, like, we, we intended to just kind of generate a little buzz by like playing the show. And it, then it ended up that it went over so well that we got so many offers after that. Do you want to be on this show? Do you want to be on this show? And this and this and this. So we kept just saying yes to everything, like trying to get out there. And we got so that's kind of like, I think another reason it ended up being a whole year in between 
when I joined and then when I when the album came out because we were just like I mean we were playing shows all the time so it was mm. kind of like there wasn't any time left to like we finally had to kind of stop and say okay we're gonna have to stop taking every show now and try to like shift energy towards getting this album done or it's never gonna happen but do you think like Lisa and Sean playing all these shows also helped get this album out a little bit more, you know, and I get you known a little bit more, not only in that area as well, but you know, you kind of get that groundswell of support as well, playing all these shows and then people kind of hear about you, know about you, and then they're all pushing it to their friends as well and things like that. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it definitely does yeah. help, doesn't it? Because um, it definitely did come out with a really good, you know, feedback as well back around that time, 2016, being a symphonic metal band as well. I want to ask a quick question though, Lisa. If the thing that pisses me off, and I probably you probably got it a lot back in the beginning, was this female fronted metal band. I always hate the term, and I know <laughs> that why bands do it, and I understand. But for me, it irritates the absolute fucking hell out of me you know it's is there a symphonic metal band gothic metal band you know what i mean it's not a, a female fronted band as a father of three daughters and just you know my mom my sisters and just a decent human being it irritates the hell out of me that we're still using this term female fronted metal band it's i don't know <laughs> i used to get super pissed about it to be honest yeah. in the beginning i was yeah. like i don't want people to come see us because i have tits i want people to come see us because we're good yep. it shouldn't matter yeah. it shouldn't matter at all so like i had this very like and i remember i remember doing an interview with somebody back way back then and she said something like well you could look at it as like well you're kind of like empowering people or women to be you know part of a, a genre that aren't that isn't typically now i mean anymore that's not the case i don't think i think there's definitely not the case yeah no but maybe at the time i don't know the, it wasn't yeah. really that long ago it was like maybe seven no. years ago that i had this did this conversation with her but yeah that that term used to piss me off as well yeah. i think i'm i think i'm like dead to it now like i'm just like okay i guess that's what it is but i um one of the things that i really like though is i think that because and I don't know if this is the case as much anymore. We It's been quite a while since we've been able to play live because COVID and all that bullshit. But the um, I used to love, you know, that we would get up on stage with our makeup and whatever. And a lot of times we were in these other, with these other bands that didn't look anything like us. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh, there she is. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But, you know, so, and, and then I'm, uh, you know, if you've seen me in person, I'm, I'm really small, like I'm like five feet tall. And I would always think, um, and you could see it on people's faces when we would get on stage and they didn't know who we were. They would just be like, okay, the fuck is this? <laughs> this is another kiss cover but band, was, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right? We got the so news awesome. boys. Yeah. <laughs> it was so cool though, to see their faces change. Right. So they would like, we would start playing. And they would be like, oh, shit, like, OK. And then they'd be like super into it by, you know, the end of the set. So that was always really awesome. I loved that. I almost like welcomed that after a while. Like I would see people looking at us and I'd be like, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. You know, because I knew like I was because, you know, we're, I'm confident in these guys I've got behind me and I know that we're going to kill it. So it's kind of like. All right, go ahead and gonna kill it and you're that. killing it. You're doing totally well. You're really, no really killing it. Only a few releases and the stain of a soul EP did drop in 2020. Tell us all about this release. Yeah, yeah. We'll let we'll let Sean and uh Carrie go in on that one. <laughs> yeah, so in 2018, the band played what at the time I thought would be its last show. We had opened for Puddle of Mud in Lynchburg, Virginia, and it was a great show, but we all knew that shortly after that, I would be relocating from the Washington, D.C. area to Seattle, which was wow. going to be an enormous move that was effectively going to make me, you know, it was going to make it impossible for me to continue with the band as far as I was concerned. And so I thought, well, it's really sad, but this is a great send off. We played that show and 
at the time we all more or less kind of understood that the band was at a good point and if we just went our separate ways or let it dissolve that might be okay and so the band did end up stopping for a time though it never officially ended it just kind of went into a dormant phase i came out to the west coast got settled in here and a few months go by and so it's probably summer of 2018 and then dean reaches out to me and says hey the band is still alive in fact there's another singer we're working with here jen janet from i believe it's blind revision um she wants to work with us on the side what do you say and i said well hell yes i mean i'll do what i can i've got a little music studio here in my place so i'll record my parts and shoot them over and i'll fly over there when i can and we can maybe put something together and so we spent probably that summer and much of the next year working on some new material with jen and so in the fall of 2019 i flew out to the east coast we met up with jen in pennsylvania and we shot a music video this was for our cover of Typo Negative's Christian Woman. Oh, Christian Woman. Christian great, Woman, great, good job. Yeah. Great job on that. Oh, that was for Virus. Yeah. That was for Virus. They or sorry, vi- Virus. Oh, Virus. virus. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, virus. yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. But, um, yeah. That's the one with yeah. the trees, yeah? Yes. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or, well, yeah. I mean, there may have been trees. Uh, there were a lot of the right one. That was yeah, the one yeah, yeah, in the warehouse. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's yeah, right. There, there okay. So yeah, it was on that EP. Both My bad. Virus and Christian Woman were on Stand of a Soul. Mm. And so during that period, we just worked with Jen on some material where you dropped that EP. And ultimately, Jen needed to pursue other things. And so it wasn't going to be like a full-time uh, commitment where she was in the band as our dedicated singer. So we went into another period of dormancy after that before uh, bringing Lisa back into the fold but that was effectively how the virus video came about and that was how stain of a soul really manifested it was just us kind of rising from the ashes of not doing anything for a while to suddenly being like hey we still want to make music what can we do what was that time do you think that fucking virus that i'm kind of fucking help <laughs> by the way that was completely unplanned no, no, <laughs> no right. kind of helped with kind of getting the yeah. very kind I, of I don't know jay i think they told the future a little bit omicron virus <laughs> virus <Sorry>. right <laughs> oh man i didn't even think about the omicron thing wow yeah <laughs> maybe we're better than we think I don't yeah know. i know man. <laughs> maybe by the simpsons we have a new <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fortune tellers. <laughs> yeah, but in well, all that... seriousness, do you think that kind of helped with pushing you guys going, look, fuck, we need something to do as well. You know, let's just kind of get fucking rolling because we all had a little more time on our hands and we're all like looking at other ways to go, fuck, I can't really wanted to do this. I know in my life, I reanalyzed a few things and gone, fuck it, okay. And this is what I want to do with my life. I'm really going to push from here and do it. Do you for think sure. it was the way for you guys as well? Yeah, absolutely. That was our time to... Uh, really reevaluate where the band was at t- at the time because Lisa had uh, rejoined and we're like, well, we got to hit the ground running here because we're, we're the best we've ever been. You know, we're about to be the best we've ever been. We just got to make it happen. We got a lot of music in the, uh, in the hopper that we need to get finished. We need to get written. Uh, we need to start recording. You know, let's start making plans because when all this BS is over, we're going to hit the ground running. We're going to go play shows. You know, that right. that's when the uh, the uh, second music video for us, which was the Phoenix, started kind of churning in the cauldron. And we thought, OK, as soon as we can. Uh, and by the way, Lisa just um, just had a baby. So if anyone oh. is watching that video, oh. they need to know that Lisa is, was was very soon after having a child in oh, that wow. video. So round of applause for her. Congratulations. So, Congratulations. Lisa. That's great. Yeah. 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 And yeah, also being in the you. studio, we recorded her vocals like, like what, a week and a half after or something like that. So yeah, it was something it was ridiculous. Like I literally showed up with the baby, like I <laughs> like with my newborn and my husband sat upstairs with her and brought her down when she needed to eat. And it was, but you know, shout out to Carrie though, because Carrie helped on uh, some of the vocals for that because obviously like literally just having a baby is not conducive to screaming. Yeah. So right. he is definitely in there supporting me uh, in my screams on on the Phoenix because of that. Uh, I was like, yeah, I don't know if this is good. <laughs> I don't I'm a little, I'm a little afraid of that, but. All I did I actually... was give you a little kick in the butt. That's all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually had it on um, 
today. The production you have on this is, can we talk about that? That's pristine. I mean, the, the every it's it's balanced so well. Uh, like every every dynamic, every ebb and flow in that. Uh, w- w- where'd you guys do it? And you know the whole process. Get into that. So we actually recorded with uh, Josh from a studio uh, called Dark Hollow. It's located near Baltimore, and this guy, uh, he he's pro. He's got an awesome yeah. little setup. He knows what he's doing. He that that was all him. It it didn't take very long to get mm. from an unmixed raw version of that track to the finished track so he's brilliant and uh we really really like working with him we're probably going to continue working with him in the future so if you like that mix you can expect more of that wonderful yeah well it is a really great mix and it's got a really really good film clip to go with it and you are talking about some of the best material you've made to date and this track here the phoenix is definitely Mm. up there as well and it must have been great for you lisa also to get back and kind of you know, with Nefarium and get this single out, but also be working on towards the future as well and what's going to be happening for 2023 for yourselves. Yeah, it was it was actually really, I mean, I was super excited about it, of course. Like, um, I think one of the coolest things was that, you know, we all were together for the first time in almost five years and it was like no time had passed. You know, like we all just kind of fell back into the way that things were. And um, I think that was that was really cool to see. But it was. uh, You know, like I was saying before, I can always count on these guys with their their work ethic and stuff like that. Like we got out there, we filmed that video. Um, Most of them were there the night for two nights. They were there the, the day before in the freaking cold. It was in we filmed in Long Island, New York. And it was cold nice. as balls out there. It was so cold. So, um, and my apologies. This is the one I thought w- w- the one with the trees. I I got I got oh, the yeah, wrong video. I apologize. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have it going on here. Yeah, really, really cool film clip. Hey, it's definitely yeah, one. No doubt. But, yeah. What? Well, when did you our, start um, working on that all? Yeah. The the video itself. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, I guess that was done in two days. Okay. Right. Like essentially like we, yeah. Um, as far as far as film, filming it and, um, it was super cool because it is done by a man named Tom Flynn. Um, and so, like I said, we went up to Long Island, New York to, to film and, uh, we nice. actually filmed in the same, same location that Lamb of God filmed, uh, ditch. Oh, ditch. Yeah. Year. Yeah. Um, so we were like kind of in the same spot and it's like, I know that we have nothing to do with it. But like it's like I feel like it's cool that like, I'm in the no, same that's... place that like well, was God gonna... was standing, right? Like you know, but it was in the um... same place. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah well, I went and yeah, bought was... the same kiddie pool from Redneck. I'm fucking sat there with a cigarette <laughs> like that dude for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's yeah, more, exactly. we actually had one of the same actors from that Len. Oh yeah. Movie. No yeah, kidding. He was the guy, uh, the guy with the long hair. We poached him from. The oh, that's video. yeah. Okay. Yeah. We had a uh, another actor, uh, actress, and um, her name was Justina, but mm. she she was not from the Lamb of God video, I believe. But they were both fantastic, and uh, and poor Adam and Justina were out there crawling around in the dirt, pretty much all night, <laughs> and they they had a tough time, but they did an excellent job on that video. So. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely sweet. Everyone jump over to YouTube, chuck them a sub, crank it up as well. Also, guys, I want to mention, man, where's the best place people can go check that? Because I've been trying to track down the digital copy. He's going to whack it up on Bandcamp or what's your plans with that one? I think what I'm understanding is that we are going to put the, as of right now, we just released it as the video. Yeah, yeah, I've seen um, that. Okay. Right. So the the digital tracks are going to be put up Sean, do you know when they're going to? So I don't have a timeline, but the intention ultimately, as far as I'm aware, is we're going to have that up available on Bandcamp, probably as a single. Don't quote me on that, though, but definitely on iTunes at some point as well. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, a lot of yeah, platforms like Bandcamp and that. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure yeah. it's going to end up on all the streaming services. But for people like me that like to actually go put their money where their mouth is and go buy the music, it's also a good place to go. Um What's what he's got planned for the future of Novarium? Because he's obviously aren't slowing down. This is just the the start of what's to come for you guys, eh? 
we got a lot of stuff coming down um in ta in talking about albums and stuff like that i think we're looking at hopefully getting another album out sometime later this year um we've got all you know kind of the material that we want to do is just a matter of getting everything laid down for it um we've looked at a lot of hopeful like shows we're starting to set everything up um we have haven't had anything that we can announce just yet because everything's huh. still in the works and everything like that so um feel free to jump in there sean i saw you <laughs> unmute there uh well yeah I, I was just going to add to that yeah um we're probably going to have some shows booked here in the next couple months we're aiming to have some return to the stage type of events probably in march in the DC area, yeah. DC, Baltimore, Northern Virginia. Again, to echo Lisa though, we haven't ironed all the details out yet, so stay tuned on that. But the intention is definitely to hit, you know, some venues sooner rather than later. And also we're working to try and have some shows out on the West Coast of the US at some point this summer too. But again, details are still being worked out, but that's absolutely where our hearts are. Yeah, definitely. And when that single drops, everybody go out and buy it as well. Also helps getting support. And the albums are all over on Bandcamp. And um, as I mentioned that yeah, debut right album, down. Omicron's yeah. like 2016, reasonable prices as well. That's the thing I like about platforms like that. Even if you can't get the CDs, you can still buy a digital copy and have that fucker sitting on your computer to play whenever you like. And great quality, flack, fucking that Spotify always dodges your sound up a bit. You know what I mean? Definitely. You can't go wrong with that, man. Exactly. Um, <laughs> best place to support you guys um, on the socials, Novarium, um, Insta, Twitter, all that kind of stuff. All of the above. Cool. We're uh, on all the things. On all the things. <laughs> go like, follow, subscribe. Um, instruments, guys. Kerry, Sean, what are you using? I was going to say, yeah. All right. Yeah, I'll go. So right now, I'm actually playing what's called an Aviator. It's a custom-made guitar. Oh, just for the the lucky few who are Ooh. online. I had this designed by this company out in the Czech Republic, and it's my first and only guitar that costs more than five hundred dollars. Quite a bit more, <laughs> as it turns out. But the thing plays yeah. up me, so that is my sound going forward. That's awesome. Very cool. So uh, at the moment, nice I use a uh, Schecter uh, Apocalypse. It's a, it's called a Schecter uh, uh, C4EX Apocalypse, and it's a four-string, 35-inch scale bass. Uh, passive pickups and everything, so it gives you a nice. nice little thump. And that's it. I put it through a dark glass B7K Ultra V2, and nice. that's my sound. So pretty yeah. simple. Awesome. Uh, speaking of guitars, Jim just recently had one designed and still being made or has it been finished yet Jim? yeah i have to assemble it. it um it's actually sitting in the case right here um i was actually gonna hit you guys up my my, my friend um uh or called slick rick customs um and we're cutting guitar bodies so uh i'd like to send you guys uh samples of what we're doing but no i, I still uh i had i had a busy uh december uh so i, I had to still uh put the explorer it's a custom explorer so uh, I have just nice. have the body and, and the neck is sitting over here somewhere. So <laughs> oh, yeah. um, I've always I've uh, I was thinking about, um, you know, uh, ordering. I, I, I play a Gibson Explorer. Uh, uh, my my bandmate, Mike, he, he um, he's endorsed by Vicious Guitars out of uh, Canada. And um, he was like, dude, you should be, you know, you're a Hetfield fan. You need to. You know, he's your biggest influence. You should be playing an Explorer. And damn it if they don't feel nice. So, um, uh, but a friend of mine, uh, he he had one of those CNC machines. And instead of um, uh, ordering something, he he cut me a custom uh, body. And it's going to be uh, very interesting. It's a single coil with a um, uh, Seymour Duncan trim. I'm sorry, uh, uh, trim bucker. Uh, blue Saraceno model trim bucker, so it's going to be an interesting tone. It's going to be kind of spanky awesome. sounding, sounds like. Huh? Yeah, 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 for <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, awesome, guys. This has been an absolute pleasure to get the chat with Novarium. We're going to go down. No Last word, shout outs, thank yous. Anything you want to add in there, my friends? We'll start with Lisa. Indeed. We just want to thank you guys. Thank you for having us on here and um, supporting us and 
it's nice to see you again, Jim. After yes, all this time. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I think it's been about four or five years. I think Probably, I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't know what year it is anymore. So I know you're right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Give up counting the years. No doubt, right? <laughs> nice, Sean. Do you want to add anything in, Mike? Uh, well, just to echo Lisa, thank you both for having us. It's been a blast. And I just want to thank anyone who's Absolutely. ever taken a chance on us. Awesome. And Carrie. 100%. Yeah. Thanks a lot for having us on the show. Of course. Uh, I just want to say to any old and new fans out there, um, we would love to see y'all at a show. It's, it's, you know, money's great, but it's not about the money for us. We just love talking to people. We love playing with people and playing for people. So if we haven't a show near you come out and see us, we would love to talk to you. That's the, that's the best thing I do want to mention. Also, when you go to shows like this as well, it's you guys are the ones sitting behind the merch stand. That's something I've always loved about my local scene, even though I've had to travel 300 kilometers to Adelaide for it. But when I go to these shows and you've got bands from the local area, you sit there, you watch them on stage, you go and have a chat, chat with them at the merch stand and it's always a blowout. I know the artists that I've talked to, they've always gone, man, it's the, the one of the best things for me is when people come up to us after the show and say g'day and tell us how much they've enjoyed the show and the connections they've made as well. And you make friends for life that way too. So everyone Absolutely. get along, catch the Novarium, buy some bloody music, put Absolutely. it in the stereos, crank it up really loud. The neighbors are going to want to hear it as well. Cheers, Novarium. Thanks guys. Cheers. Thank you. Oi, you know what time it is? You're tuned in listening to Joy That Aussie Metal Guy. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss any of his content when it drops. And remember, stay brutal, you mad dogs. Roof.